Hi, AP Bio. Today we're going to learn a little more about enzymes to give you some background information as you continue designing and planning your Catalase Lab experiment for tomorrow. As we talked about yesterday, enzymes are a really good example of the connection between structure and function. Their shape is really critical to how they work. Enzymes are usually proteins and they're molecules that act as biological catalysts, which mean they speed up chemical reactions, but the enzyme itself isn't changed or used up. Obviously, this is really important because all of life depends on chemical reactions to build and break down molecules and produce energy constantly. Enzymes work by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. That's the energy that's needed to kind of turn, contort, shape the reactant molecules to break bonds or to put them in the correct position to create a new bond. So this graph here kind of shows the difference between a reaction without an enzyme and one with an enzyme. The x-axis here just shows the reaction progress from beginning to end, and the y-axis gives you the amount of energy. The hill that you see at the beginning here represents the activation energy. And so the purple line is the activation energy of a reaction without an enzyme that's uncatalyzed. And you can see it takes a really big push to get that reaction started. What enzymes do is they decrease that initial input of energy so that reactions can get started more quickly and therefore happen more quickly within cells. Each enzyme is specific to the reaction that it catalyzes. So the reactant, the molecule that it acts on is called the substrate. The substrate is basically like the reactant in the chemical reaction. So in this diagram you see here, the pink molecule is the substrate. Each enzyme can only bond with its specific substrate. And that has to do with its shape and with the chemistry of the R groups of the amino acids right in that active site. This is also referred to as a complementary fit. The shape of these two molecules complements each other um, so that they can fit together like a key in a lock or like puzzle pieces. The substrate binds to this region of the enzyme known as the active site. All the little blue circles on this enzyme um, represent different amino acids that make up that protein. Um, and this protein, like all the other ones we talked about earlier this week, has a primary structure, that order of amino acids, which then folded and coiled up on itself, that secondary and tertiary structure, into this shape. And that shape specifically has this little nook in there where the substrate can bind. Once the substrate binds, something called induced fit happens. There are little chemical um, changes that happen right around that R site due to chemical interactions between the substrate molecule and the R groups in that active site. So that the protein just kind of tightens up around the substrate and kind of gives it a little hug that's called induced fit. Once the substrate is bound to the active site, then the enzyme can help to catalyze the reaction, can help that reaction to happen. This can happen in a few different ways. Some enzymes just help orient the molecule. Molecules tend to just kind of randomly bounce off of each other. Um, and sometimes they have to hit at just the right angle to form a chemical bond. And so what the enzyme does is it attaches those substrates in the perfectly lined up way so that it's really easy for that bond to form. They can also stretch molecules to lower the energy needed to break the bond. So that's kind of like um, we talked yesterday, if you were in house A, about bending a stick, like the activation energy. That would kind of be like if somebody had already mostly bent it, all you would have to do is snap it and it would be much easier. There'd be less work for you to do. Enzymes can also create a little mini microenvironment right within that active site. If all of the amino acids within the active site, for example, are acidic, um, then that little part of the protein will have a lower pH and perhaps that allows the reaction to happen more easily. So the chemistry of the amino acids in the active site can help the reaction to happen more easily. Occasionally, an enzyme will directly participate in the reaction itself, but that's not very common. 
the enzyme overall is not used up or changed during a chemical reaction. It's like a tool that can be used over and over and over. You use a hammer to pound in a nail, but you can use that same hammer to pound in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nails. You just do the same thing over and over. And enzymes do that as well. They help catalyze the reaction, release the products, and then they're ready to bind to another substrate molecule and do it all over again. Some enzymes require some things that are called cofactors. You can think of these like enzymatic helpers. Um, they're not protein molecules and they attach to the enzyme either permanently or temporarily. So here you can see this blue protein is inactive by itself, but when the cofactor binds to it, then it becomes active and it can actually catalyze a reaction. Um, a lot of the, the things that we need in our diet in small amounts are necessary as cofactors or coenzymes to help with these reactions. Things like minerals, zinc, iron, and copper. Some organic molecules, which are usually referred to as coenzymes, um, and some vitamins. So like I said, those things that you know you need in your diet, but we don't need very much of, um, are often necessary for these chemical reactions as cofactors. There are several other factors that can affect the activity of an enzyme and how quickly it can perform these reactions. You're going to watch a short video now, and as you watch, take some notes on how these three environmental factors, substrate, temperature, and pH, can affect the activity of enzymes, and also how different types of inhibitors can affect enzyme activity. Um, the environmental factors should look familiar. Those are the things that we will be testing in the catalase lab tomorrow. So that'll help you to understand the results that you get from that lab. So take a minute and watch this video. All right, last thing. Before tomorrow's class, make sure that you have completed the pre-lab for the catalase experiment that's in the homework section of classroom today. If you decided to join a group virtually for this lab, you'll be joining them um, during class this afternoon and you'll do some of your lab design together. If you are not joining virtually, you still need to go in and design your experiment on that document, on the lab document. Once that's finished on Friday, I will look at your pre-lab and see which variable you wanted to test. Um, and then I will share a video with you if you're not joining a virtual group. Um, so you can collect data from that experiment and continue on with the post lab. If you have any questions as you work through your pre-lab, please feel free to shoot me an email, and I hope you have a great afternoon.